Okay, so it looks like we're all here. So um, good evening all and welcome. Good to see you all. Um, let's go ahead and get our city council meeting uh, started. City of North Plains, city council meeting tonight, regular session meeting for Tuesday, February 22nd. Call me, please, 2022 at seven o'clock via Zoom. Lori, go ahead for roll call, please. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Councilor Fage? Here. Councilor Kendall? Here. Councilor Martinez? Here. Councilor Papin? Here. Councilor Sheldon? Present. Councilor Smith? Here. And Mayor Linehan? Here. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate that. Tonight, uh, let's see, we have the consent agenda, which is item number four on our agenda. It's the approval of tonight's agenda and also the council minutes from February 7th, 2022. Are there any corrections or additions for the minutes that we need to be aware of? Move for adoption. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion on the table by uh, Councillor Kindle, seconded by Councillor Martinez. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Say nay. Hearing none, motion carried. Thank you. Um, item five is the public comment. This is the time that we uh, wish and encourage folks from our public would uh, come and talk about things not on our agenda. And uh, there's always all kinds of fun things going on on social media, but uh, uh, Lori, is there anything um, submitted in writing or um, can you tell if there's anyone online that would like to speak? I did not receive anything in writing prior to the meeting. And at this time, I don't see any hands raised or um, notes in the chat. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, Lori. Appreciate it. Hope you're feeling better too. I'm getting there. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tonight um, we do have, you know, staff night report, staff report. We do have a public hearing to go through and um, we've got a few things on our agenda this evening. So I'm um, going to go ahead and introduce staff. Item number 6A. Uh, Robin, you are first up. Oh, wait a minute. I don't see her. Oh, there she is. Robin, can you hear me? I can. Sorry about that. I had a little technical difficulties. Um, and I was off and now I'm back in. Is it my turn? Yeah, you've got a little feedback there. Okay. Ah. That might help. I muted one of your, okay, go ahead, Robin. Yeah, you're up now. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, uh, we might wanna just go on to the next report real quick. I'm trying to just use an, my husband's office and having some problems, so. Okay. Um, I'll fix my video so that you can see me. Okay. Um, sorry about that. No, take your time. Um, we'll, Go to uh, Chief Haxton. Hey, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, Councilors. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Let me see if I can share screen. Okay, I can't share my screen, so I'm just going to go off to the, the thing. So uh, in January, this is February, so in January, uh, North Plains had 180 uh, our officers went to 180 calls or, or something activities. Um, and that, uh, looking at the numbers, if that's what you want to look at, it's, it's right in par, uh, with the public demand calls and stuff. So we're, we're right in the, right on the average or, or just a little plus or minus, um, for last month. Uh, the main thing is, uh, there's been a lot of, um, uh, stolen vehicles. Uh, that seems to be the hot topic in North Plains, uh, but uh, not just North 
plain, but really the county in general, and that's uh, all the cities as well. And that's something in the, the law enforcement council uh, that's come up a bunch of times because that, um, whether they're the folks from Portland or, or around Portland, uh, it doesn't matter, but all the cities and all the agencies are being hit with uh, stolen vehicles and catalytic converter theft. That's kind of the, uh, the big thing right now. Um, and anymore, um, it seems like it's easier to steal the car and take it someplace to cut off the catalytic converter than it is just to uh, cut it right there. I don't know if they're, you know, thieves evolve uh, and that's just what happens. So <clears throat> again, that's the big thing. And there's no, I don't have a good answer to, to solve it because this is, again, this isn't just our city that's dealing with this. It's the entire county uh, and actually multiple counties. Uh, and that's kind of the same. I don't know how much you know, but that's kind of what happened this weekend as well. So multiple uh, cars got stolen this weekend. Uh, the nice thing is, is uh, one of them, uh, they were able to catch and, and recover some of the stuff. And actually someone was arrested in Beaverton because I think they went to a Home Depot lot uh, and they were caught cut, cutting off the catalytic converter. So uh, the other good one is, is I know Schutz has a good lead and he's working, uh, working the other stolen vehicle case from last weekend. So uh, we're making progress, uh, at least trying to identify and arrest some folks. Um, but that's, that's kind of short term. Um, again, I think all of the law enforcement leaders are trying to work and figure out the as best we can how to deal with this. Uh, that's really the the highlights, I guess, of, of North Plains for for police activity going going last month. I had a question about catalytic converters. Speaking of that, yes, sir. Does every? I'm assuming there's only a few people that actually buy them. <laughs> Is it widespread where everybody will buy them? Is just you just can't track who's going to buy catalytic converters, or well, is it or is that kind of a bottleneck where it's you know well, like hey, my how many people are selling are buying those? Yeah, my understanding, and I can't, I, I'm no expert when it comes to to, to metal, right? Uh, and really, what we're talking about is precious metals. Uh, one of the things that my understanding is is somehow you know how they're fencing them, I don't know, but my understanding is crates are going back to China. So like they're putting them, they'll fill up uh, these large bins. What are they? Uh, these big storage bins, put them on a, on a, a container um, and put them on a container ship and they'll take them back to China. How exactly that's happening? I can't tell you exactly. It's kind of like the drug trade out of Mexico, how it's all being farmed up through here. I, I couldn't tell you all the ins and outs. I just know what happens. Uh, and my understanding is, is that's what's happening now. Uh, they're working on, someone's talking about slowly through the legislation, putting serial numbers on catalytic converters, because that's the other issue that we're having, right? Yes, there's laws against just transporting uh, uh, metal, you know, like metal theft. you can't just, just you've got to have paperwork for it. However, there are no serial numbers on catalytic converters. So you stop a guy with a catalytic converter, you have no idea where it's from. And so it's hard to track that. When we start getting serial numbers, uh, and then we'll be able to put them into leads just like it would for any other stolen merchandise that has a serial number. Uh, and then we can track it when we find someone that's got catalytic converters. Now we can link them to another crime. So uh, that is a ways off is my understanding. Uh, but I know that's some of that stuff that they're working on. And this is, now I don't want to say it's relatively new because they've been stealing catalytic converters forever, um, or at least, you know, for the last 15 years or so, because I remember uh, us doing bait cars and stuff with this. It's just becoming more prevalent. And I don't know if it's because they've added a better precious metal to the case. <coughs> uh, but I can tell you, bang for the buck, I think they're getting quite a bit of money for, for the precious metal that's in it. Yeah, it's like 90 bucks worth of worth of, uh, worth of platinum, so. And it's again, it's, Councilor it's Payton pretty amazing. Has her hand up. They're literally just taking the car. I, I said it before earlier, it's surprising to me that they'll they'll steal the car to take it somewhere where they can cut off the catalytic converter. It's amazing to me uh, because the one theft is more than the other. You know, stealing a car is a, is, a, is the bigger felony, uh, but that's what they're doing. Um, so, uh, and I guess you get the goods, whatever's in the car, but it happens very quick and they know what they're doing. I'm sorry, I'll take the next question. Chief Haxton, I was just curious, the car thefts that are occurring in North Plains, are they crimes of opportunity? Like, 
maybe keys are left in the car or is there another way that they're stealing cars? Good question. I do not believe that it's from uh, like a keys being left in the car. I believe a lot of these um, are specific to stealing catalytic converters. And, and so they drive around and they find what they want and then they're able to, to, to get that car. Does that make sense? So I don't believe it's just people leaving keys in their car. Um, I can't tell you exactly how they're picking which cars they're taking, um, but a lot of them seem to be pickups. Uh, and then the other one is some of these cars. I don't know. I, to be honest with you, I don't know if they're just, it's so random. I don't know if they're just using it for transportation to get from here to there. In other words, I don't know. I, I can't say for certain that they're not stealing a car, taking it to a neighborhood where they can, go through cars and do the car thefts like normal and then picking a car and stealing it to drive back to wherever they want to go. Does that make sense? Uh, I can't say for sure. I, it seems like it's that and the catalytic converters. Those are kind of the two things, but I, I can't, it's hard to say because it's hard to catch them uh, because it's happening so quickly. Okay. I um, I, I, was at a me I was at a meeting with Kevin Barton and the sheriff um, about a week ago, and, you know, they gave us some really interesting statistics that a lot of crimes that are happening in Washington County, and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out where are these people coming from, right, who are coming into Washington County to commit these crimes of, you know, personal property, whatever, whatever, and they're lodging them, and they're, they're, saying that, I mean, the, the large majority of them are coming from Multnomah County, right? From the Portland and, and Gresham area, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we seem to be, you know, being, I mean, how many other bedroom communities, smaller communities, not just in Washington County, but even in Clackamas and Multnomah, you know, are, are being affected by this kind of stuff. There's a lot to talk about here. I know. Yeah. Um, I know this is staff report night, um, and there's this is a this is a hot topic, and this is a topic that I think that we all want to talk about, and 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 ask more questions about. And and you know, if council wants to ask specific questions about this, go for it. But know too that I know it's a topic that we could talk probably for the next hour or so about. But I, I want to respect people's questions and time and, and opinion. I've got an opinion. Uh, Councilor Sheldon, go for it. Well, folks, uh, it's time to act. And when I say that, I mean it. And what I mean is that we have two things we have to do. One is now and the other is the future. The future is something we can discuss at the retreat in terms of the numbers that generally were provided to us uh, about what the situation would look like to add 24 seven coverage. I think the people in this community are ready for it. I think they'll support it. And I don't think we need to be waiting. And on top of that, I can tell you, there's a lot of shenanigans going on in this community after hours. It's not all thefts. But uh, I can tell you from firsthand experience that, you know, we are a target because we don't have coverage and people are spilling out from our metro areas to come and just pillage what they want. The jails are full of criminals and they don't have enough jail space to hold people creating property crime. But we have to be we have to be cognizant of what the element is in our community and how we cover that. And my proposal tonight is pretty simple. Let's get some overtime hours bought. Let's get with Chief Haxton. I made a call to the sheriff today and I got a call back from the executive director and I had an at length discussion with him. I also spoke with city manager Varner because I'm, I'm not interested in waiting. I wanna get some patrols after hours now. Let's get some money. It's in our budget. And let's get that until we get the piece figured out of what we're going to go to the voters for. Because I know the voters in this community right now will support 
a levy for public safety. And frankly, we don't have enough rubber on the road after 10 o'clock at night. And I don't know what, I don't have any idea if we even know how many hours we're actually on the road patrolling. But this has to happen. This, we cannot let this go. And I don't think we need any resolutions or anything else. We just need to do it. I saw a couple heads shake. And I think that is, uh, uh, you know, I would have to agree with Councillor Sheldon um, that we need to be a lot more proactive about this. Uh, Councillor Kindle. Yes, the only comment I'll make, but I agree with everything Russ said, but because we don't want things happening like they did over the weekend in Portland. We don't, we don't want it to get to that level. We want way before that. And it's, we just don't want that. So let's get it done. <clears throat> If you want to randomize the overtime, not make it a full-time contract, but just do here and there shots, just to um, make it more random, so people don't, you know, it's kind of like a, a study when you do, you do things here and there, and um, maybe get some more bang for the buck that way, just by doing a few. Before we get, you know, just have a few weeks here, a few weeks there. I'm interested in that to see what turns up. Well, I think that I think that council needs to have um, we need to have a consensus that that's the direction that we want, and then we need to entrust uh, Chief Haxon and uh, Andy to figure out the plan. Yeah, because I'm I'm in support of shifting hours. We need less daytime hours and more nighttime hours. Yep. And if we need to buy overtime to make that happen, we fill in the blanks until we can get the vote out there in November and get the bond passed. Yep. Okay. Amen. Yeah. Uh, can I consensus from council? Aye. Thumbs up. Okay. I would like to keep the ones we do have and though and just try to get extra. Like I don't want to shift our wonderful daytime people of what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like they are they obviously selected to come here probably because of the shift. So I don't want to like then, hey, you're gonna be here at 2 a.m. Like I'd like to see different bodies, you know, supporting our town at night and keeping our, you know, cause they just know they've been here now and they, they, they know the ropes of our town and stuff during the day. So just work quality too. Like, I don't want to lose. I know I was like been a broken record. I feel like for two years. So I'm very <laughs> excited that everybody heads this way. Yeah. I'd like to see a couple of plans laid out. Uh, if one had, my idea would be to uh, throw some money at it and have people come in at night, just not full time, just random here and there, just to mix it up. And, you know, it's not like a, every night different people are doing it. It's the same guys doing crime. So if we catch them, then, you know, we're pretty good. Well, is there yeah, a certain I, night that they're doing this on? Is it like a Friday or Saturday night or? I don't think that we should know that. To be honest with you, I think that we should entrust Chief Haxton and Andy to figure it out and let them do the schedule. I think <laughs> the council is saying we have a consensus here. We need nighttime coverage. And because we have issues in this community, and I don't think that we should know when they're going to be here necessarily, because then again, we're going to advertise it. And I don't think that that's what we need to be doing. You know, right? We don't need to be doing that. And uh, although I respect your question, Councillor Smith. I just don't think that's what we need to be asking for. We should just say, do it, make it happen, and let's see what the results are. Oh, oh I was mom. asking what, <laughs> night, what days are they actually, this crime happening? Is it mostly is it night that's happening now? Yep. Yeah. After hours? Oh, Here's that I, way. Yeah, it is. They know we're open for business after hours. And I've had it. There's just, I've had a number of business owners come to me, especially in the past week. And then to have top it off, my brother-in-law had the subject vehicle stolen. There was three stolen vehicles and a stolen trailer there. So there's a lot of stuff going on and I think it's picking up. I don't think it's slowing down. And we need to make a shift. We need to pivot and get this handled. And just to add, I know not everyone here is on social media but we do have a North Plains community page and so people like to really vent and go at it on there I granted they're not here talking now or 
bringing their concerns, but I, I mean, I think they've wanted this for a long time and they're very vocal on that page. If you know a friend or a family member, um, there's just a lot of comments and it's, it's kind of become like when we always gave speeding tickets on the part of 26, like people just now know, oh, well, North Plains doesn't have police at night. So it's kind of like, it, it kind of reminds me of that, of like, now it's like tagged that way, sort of. Yeah, we're not a toll booth anymore. We're like a, you know, uh, <laughs> shop and carry. 7-Eleven, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I, 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 and I know personally um, that counselors and other community members have like drilled it. They're telling people, call in, call in, call in, call in. And, you know, we know that, that individuals and businesses are not necessarily calling non-emergency and calling 911 and they're calling like police officers or, they're, you know, and, so we understand, I, I totally hear, and it's very, very, very frustrating um, that the community members are not, you know, hearing the call and say, call 911 or call non-emergency if you see something. Um, and it's frustrating on our part, and it's gotta be like a hundred times frustrating for Chief Paxton and his crew, totally. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what the answer is, Chief, but um, I'm hearing pretty loud and clear from this group that we <laughs> should it up a little bit and we're gonna entrust you and Andy to figure out what that looks like. Okay, I copy and uh, just so everyone knows, uh, just to answer a couple things is, uh, I would like to say that it's happening on the weekend, primarily, unfortunately, uh, some of it is happening on the weekends, but it's random. It'll also be during the week on a certain weekday. So it's, um, it's kind of like fishing for, for something where you're not sure exactly when it's going to be there. Um, so yeah, it's both on the weekends, but it's also during the week. We leave it to you. Any other comments for Chief Paxson before I go back to Robin? Chief Paxson, you're good. Any other feedback or comments for us? No, oh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, Andy and I can. We were talking about that today, and we can we can start coming up with a plan and 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 figuring out what we can do. But absolutely, we can we can get some stuff uh, some coverage at night. Thank you very much for listening to us. Appreciate that. Uh, Robin, can we go back to you now? Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yay! Sorry about all that. Um, so I just, you saw my report, we're still playing around with sort of our charts and, and whatnot to give you the best sort of statistical snapshot. So um, I'm interested in any feedback on that. We are giving out uh, youth bicycle helmets at the library. We had some left from National Night Out, thanks to the um, <laughs> And so we're giving those out until they're gone. We have small, medium, and large. So we already gave out some today while I was there. And um, that's, um, other than that, we're just still able to be open normal hours and programming is going well. And I, I'm um, available for any questions you might have. That's all. We've got some pretty good adult uh, services coming up. Uh, um, that's pretty exciting. And mm -hmm. I would imagine the um, story time for the kids and everything is still going pretty strong. It is, it is. Um, people appreciate it. We'll be grateful when we have, we can move it back indoors um, in person, but we still, we have quite, Emily has quite a strong online following now. <laughs> So um, that's been very successful. One of the few libraries that offered the live online story time and she's training other organizations and libraries. Um, I do know that the North Plains Events Association is, um, uh, they're talking about in-person um, things for the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So um, 
if you haven't already reached out to them, you know, uh, Sherry, Patty, you know, Russ or I, um, you need to do that because, you know, there's some good opportunities to partner with some uh, in-person activities and um, opportunities. Oh, great. Well, Brianna went to the um, Parks and Rec board meeting last Monday. Um, and some of the same people are on there. I, I think there's some overlap, isn't there? Yeah, well, yeah. And I was at Between. the meeting too. And she offered to, uh, okay. and then Patty Burns was on the parks. And, but she offered right. to, to help, um, you know, remember the library. They want to volunteer. They want to help. So I think yep. that's Great. Yeah, we'll be doing picnic bingo again this summer. We are getting all of our summer plans are pretty much set. Uh, for a lot of in-person, we're still planning on, they can be outside or inside, trying to do it like we did last year where it's sort of um, flexible. We did, we were hit with the smoke and the heat last year for one of our events, but um, hopefully the heat and smoke and COVID trifecta won't happen this summer. <laughs> Still not. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Before you go off, Robin, I have my hand up. Oh, I see you, James. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, I'm Thanks. sorry. So uh, let me go to raise it a little, little bit hand. Uh, speaking about bike helmets, uh -huh. um, I'm glad they're at the library. It's a great way to encourage the kids to go to the library and plus library has better hours than city hall. Also, I was wondering, maybe you could put a couple in the police cars, James. Uh, put some in the police cars because um, when the police are driving around, I see kids driving their bikes without a helmet. Maybe, hey, here's, here's a helmet for you. Maybe that'd be a good thing for our public relations as well. Since we have them, we can, be, we can put them inside the library to you know, encourage kids to go to the library plus better hours, maybe even, even in the police cars. Good, 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 interactions with the cops pulling over here you go here's a free helmet good idea just an idea yeah yeah any other comments from council okay we'll move on to um blake and his report good evening uh february is the shortest month of the year and i think I have the shortest staff report of the year. Uh, the new reservoir and pump station that went live uh, as of February 2nd. We have a 30 day uh, test run, so we're almost done with that. Things are going well. Uh, I invite any of the council members to, uh, if they're interested in seeing our SCADA system and our new pump station and reservoir, to give me a uh, a date. I'd be happy to take them out and show them, uh, you know, what we just spent seven and a half million dollars on. I'm, I'm down. Are you? Are you? Are you free tomorrow? <laughs> uh, I'll be in the office. Yeah. Sweet. Give Let me a time. Know. I'll be there. <laughs> I'm. I'm there from seven to four. You pick the time. <laughs> cool. I I know the Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, Cindy Hurst, um, actually expressed an interest in um, maybe doing a ribbon cutting, cutting if possible. So um, I might have her uh, go direct with you, Blake, to see sure. if that's possible. OK, and uh, well, just uh, a couple items. Like I said, very, very short uh, staff report. Uh, you might have noticed that the uh, on the boardwalk, the privacy screening is, is starting to be put up uh, behind those three homes on 306th. Uh, the screening is started actually yesterday and should be completed by the end of this week. And next on the report is we still don't have a VAC truck back yet. Uh, it's, it's still in the shop. Uh, it's... Like I said, there was $48,000 worth of damage done to it. And we thought we were gonna pick it up the other day, but uh, some parts still weren't uh, working correctly. Uh, but uh, from, the, from the theft, we have replaced the, the door, the pump house and have had the gate replaced. So it is, we're back to being secure. And uh, uh, like I said, other than the, the back truck, we're, we're, we're pretty much back to normal. Do we have yes. any um, um, 
plans to try to cover any costs from the perpetrator? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, cover the cost on, on what? Do we have any plans on suing or covering the cost from the perpetrator? I, I'm sorry, one more time. Um, are we uh, going to try to sue or do any kind of covering of the for restitution? The perpetrator? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, well, they're they're attempting. So, uh, uh, Andrew went before the grand jury on I think it was last week, and uh, there, this actually goes before like a the court. Uh, I think it's the first. I think it's next week that uh, we're going and. Um, yeah, they, it's it's known that we're we're looking for some type of restitution, and the, the insurance company has asked asked about that also. But okay. what what we're going to get all depends on the individual too. I thought the insurance companies do that stuff, not the city. Well, they have to have our our blessing that we want to go press Purchase. forward with it. Right. Any other questions for Blake on his report? Councilor Martinez. Sorry, I didn't even know where the raise hand thing was on, on Zoom. Um, I, I was curious on the path, that lower section where it'll connect into the neighborhood. I know like that stretch of road that those homes on, it says private drive. So. Mm -hmm the sidewalk ends and there was like at least a nice little concrete path that kind of connected it um anyways are they is there going to be is that going to extend out who's going to maintain that area because now it's like kind of all just broken up in a mess really right right the, the the contractor when he was working behind there he actually drove the uh you know like a 10 yard truck full of rock and material back there and um the, the, it was an asphalt path and it was, definitely wasn't uh, constructed to handle that load and it, it was definitely damaged the with the, the the ground is way too wet to to try to actually do any type of repair right now so we actually are are holding back well, we've had a, a an estimate done on what it would cost to repair that, and we're holding that from the retainage, and that'll be repaired uh, with those funds once once everything dries out. Okay, cool. And then our since that is a private drive, so I know it had overgrown a lot. Is it that little community of houses to maintain that area down there, or is it? I just didn't wasn't sure considering since it's a private drive what that really it, is. I, I would consider that, you know, that part of it, uh, it was same with the, you know, just behind the homes where the, where the concrete path is, it leads up to the ramp. That's all, you know, cities walk path. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions from council for Blake? All right. Thank you, Blake. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, James. I'll see you tomorrow. And uh, you, like I said, give me a give me a call before you you come. And uh, just I, I'll be I'll be there. I just I'll just have to. Yeah, I sent you a message asking about about nine a.m. But I'll see you there. Okay, works for me. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks. All right. Next up is um, Bill. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I. I don't have any exciting stories to tell, um, thankfully, regarding um, the city's uh, money. <laughs> um, but, and I won't try not to get in the weeds about it. You have all the information there before you, really our operating funds, um, general fund, uh, streets fund and water fund. Um, for the most part, um, no major changes in terms of um, expenditures um, at, most of the time at or below budget um, for this point, uh, of time in the year. Um, I think one of the big, big things is, is we, we, we promised that we would have a lot of um, electronic transactions that hadn't been entered into the system yet, had been paid and, and all budgeted, but hadn't been formally entered. Um, our senior accounting um, clerk that we hired not long ago, Jen Cooper, she dug into a lot of the um, electronic transactions and 
got things entered in. So we're all caught up in terms of the numbers that you see before you. Um, and the, for general fund spending in particular, there weren't a lot of changes or additions. It wasn't a, a sizable amount of transactions missing, but they have been entered. And um, a number of them are really probably for the, the li library, really. Um, the library does a lot of um, transactions that are electronic um, for some of their vendors for materials and media that they have. So we got all that entered in. And so the numbers are um, fully accurate for um, on, on that account, basically. So we're all caught up and things are looking pretty normal um, and, and nothing too, um, too, too interesting to report. Um, same for the streets fund and the water fund. Things are kind of continuing as they have been. Um, generally speaking, water revenues still are up above, still kind of running higher than, than we projected, which is a positive thing. So that's been a positive uh, contribution to the water fund um, balance, at least as of the end of January. Um, probably, I guess the thing I would focus on here really is just overdue account status, kind of that update um, on the, I believe, fourth page, third or fourth page of the report. I'm looking at the numbering system that Lori puts on it for the whole packet. But the bottom line is that um, through the month of January, um, we had a net reduction of overdue balances of just over $620. And that amounts to 18 fewer overdue balances um, or 18 overdue balances being settled, net 18 over the course of January. So that's three months in a row where we've moved in a positive direction. Um, January wasn't post Christmas, so people probably didn't have as much money uh, post holidays to spend on overdue balances, but we still came out in a positive direction for the, for the balance for the city, um, for the water utility at, um, at the end of January. So um, relatively speaking, a, a quite positive month. So that's three in a row. Um, but we'll continue to track that for you just so you can kind of see um, where we've been. And then there's just kind of a, a comparison to the end of January of 2020, a couple months before COVID really hit us. Um, at that time, um, we only had about $6,000 overdue. And that's probably a low point um, for city water utility uh, overdue balance. Um, so that's where, we, where, it, where it stacks up right now versus where we were right almost right before COVID. But anyway, the important thing is three, three positive months in a row, including folks not having as much money to spend because of the holidays. Um, other things going on, um, I guess I would just kind of, the big thing I would point out in terms of other finance department activities is um, the third bullet point. Um, budget season is coming soon. <laughs> And it's a biennial budget. So the budget hearings process and all of that process will be much simpler this time because last time around last year, city council, you all adopted a two-year budget. So really the process coming up in April um, for the budget committee is fine tuning and modifying <coughs> and, and checking on status and maybe um, moving things here or moving things there a little bit, but really kind of fine tuning and tweaking for the second year of the of the budget, it's not. It doesn't. It, it's not a full um, process like uh, it usually is. Basically, so fine tuning. But either way, we have two vacancies on the committee. We got um, one. I know. I know of one application that we've gotten from somebody on another committee who's very active on that committee, and that person would be a great addition to the budget committee. Which means we have at least one more vacancy. So um, just wanted to encourage folks to get the word out that having another person on to fill um, the remaining vacancy would be wonderful. And we expect that the third week of April, I believe either the 20th or 21st, um, will, will be the first, likely the first budget committee hearing um, of this year. So a few weeks away, but it's going to pass faster than you think. <laughs> so please do get the word out, anybody interested in, in joining um, the budget committee for your term. And so then- are we taking um, app? Are we taking applications or um, for the budget committee up until what April fourth? Or do we have a target date on that? I'm sorry, did I miss that? I didn't state a target date, Lori. Um, do you know what the what the the cutoff date is for the budget committee applications? Usually, just leave it open until filled, um, especially in this situation because we do need two people. So. Um, at this point, we don't have a, a closed date for it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then 
this is just these last two little charts are kind of a, a, a bit of a taste of what we'll talk about at the retreat from a city fiscal sustainability planning standpoint. Um, but very quickly, um, the two charts really kind of compare North Plains and the just the city of Hillsboro. They're our neighbor. <laughs> so it's, it's difficult not to kind of compare on a few different things just to get a sense of context. But after Bryn Hill is built out, um, the city's tax base, 83% of the city's tax base is going to be from residential development, taxable residences, homes, and that sort of thing, residential uses. Whereas 17% of the city's tax base after Bryn Hill is built out will be employment uses, non-residential uses, um, and there it's taxable assessed value. Um, and so let's just kind of context for where the city is going to be in a few years, two or two, three, four years. And the chart on the right is where Hillsborough is right now after taking a, a lot, you know, many years of effort at employment land and employment capacity. 43% 43 43 of their current taxable assessed value in the city is residential, um, as opposed to a full 57% non-residential or employment uses. So this is just a comparison of where we where we are going to be in a few years and what we know we have to reverse. Um, so just some context and some information and we'll drill Good. down into this stuff at the retreat. <coughs> yeah, so you're suggesting we get a fab over here? <laughs> you, you know, I, 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 I think at the end of the day, if we got a number of quality employers to move to North Plains, we'd be winning. That would be a good win. And um, also, Bill, I know that you sent out an email late in the day to, um, to the council. Would you mind just um, hitting the high notes on that? Oh, sure. Um, so our, the, the developer that we have an, an agreement, uh, an exclusive negotiating agreement with, Rembold, to develop the Glencoe Opportunity Area property, um, the Fresh Foods and Hardware Store Anchored um, Center. Um, Andy and I met with them last week. And they gave a full rundown of where the project is, where the planning is, um, what they're doing with it. And basically the information I sent along was um, they've, they've provided ample evidence of being fully committed to the project. They've added quite a bit of, of planned space, um, more restaurant space and a few other things have been added. So they're very excited and very proactive <laughs> about developing the project. Um, they're working on some things that we'd like for them to, we'd like to see from them as far as some steps to kind of show some, some of their planning and numbers, uh, dollar figures, I should say, but they're not quite there yet. And that's okay. Um, they, they, they demonstrate a lot of very positive steps and commitment. So we're, we were happy with that. And then the action item that you want from council is to, there is a link in there for a doodle poll because they want council to part, be uh, a participant in the um, uh, design workshop, right? That, that, is, that is correct, Mayor, and a very good point. It's down in the email, but there is a link to a doodle poll for a number of different possibilities for that workshop to happen for about an hour. And um, Callie Bader from um, Rembold would like to walk you all through and kind of do a workshop on what they're planning and get your input, feedback, suggestions, and then kind of fold that into what they're doing. So um, please follow that link and, and pick times that work for you so we can plan that um, middle of March. Um, if there's if for some reason, you know, if we're all working and can't do that, um, would they be uh, opening this opportunity up to Planning Commission and ECDEV? Um, I'm not, that I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I, I think we, we, we definitely want some more people on. I think Andy had um, thought about some people to, to bring on for sure from Planning Commission and probably ECDEV committee. Um, but as far as how many, how many total people, I'm, I'm not sure what works best. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure that we have good representation in case folks are, um, you know, counselors are busy if they're working or whatnot. That's all. Nope. Makes sense. Okay. Any questions for Bill on his report, his email? Okay. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.
Next item on our agenda is the public hearing uh, for ordinance number 477, which is the pro proposed zoning code and comp plan updates. First reading. Hi, Heather. Hi. <laughs> this is your um, item, I would imagine. That's correct. We'll, um, we'll have Lori read the public meeting notice before we jump in, but yep, this is all me. Are you ready, Mayor? Yes, please. Thank you. The North Plains City Council will conduct a legislative public hearing regarding implementing and updating to the zoning and development code and comprehensive plan. The order of business will be as follows. The mayor will open the public hearing and request the staff report. The council may ask questions at any time during the public hearing. Any written correspondence submitted on behalf of this item will be orally presented, including the individual's name and address. The public will be invited to provide oral and written testimony on the proposed zoning and development code and comprehensive plan. Additional staff comments will then be presented. The mayor will call for council comments and discussion. The mayor will close the public hearing or continue the hearing to a specific time and date. All persons testifying shall be deemed parties to the proceeding and must provide their name and full correct mailing address or if preferred, their email address. Parties will be notified of the decision, continuances, appeals, or other procedural actions required by the code and state law. The city <coughs> municipal code zoning and development standards specified applicable criteria to be relied upon in making a decision. Those criteria and findings of fact are in the city staff report. Public testimony should be limited to those criteria and findings of fact or to other city or state land use standards that the person testifying believes applies to the proposed zoning and development code and comprehensive plan. Failure to raise an issue in person or in writing with sufficient detail to afford the hearing body and parties to the hearing an opportunity to respond to that issue precludes appeal to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals. All right, thank you, Lori, appreciate that. So at this time, I will go ahead and open up the public hearing at 7.48. Wish I had my gavel. <laughs> um, Heather, yes. uh, staff report? Thank you, Mayor Linehan. I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen. I have a brief uh, presentation to accompany the packet that you all received prior to this meeting. Let me just set it to um, display, there we go. So this evening you are reviewing city file number 22-001, which is uh, updates to the zoning and development code as well as the comprehensive plan for the city. So the Proposed changes were recommended for approval by the Planning Commission at their meeting on February 9th. That same evening, we did have the joint work session uh, prior to the meeting where the City Council and the Planning Commission were given um, a longer version of this slideshow that, go, that went section by section and talked about the proposed changes, um, all of those changes that are in your packet this evening. So for this presentation and the packet you received, um, you've been given the Planning Commission's recommendation, the proposed language with the changes, um, as well as a draft ordinance that would adopt the language. So the City Council this evening is being asked to conduct the public hearing, approve the proposed changes, and do conduct a first reading and approve the first reading of Ordinance 477. The proposed updates to the code sections are pretty extensive. They cover a lot of sections of the code, and this is based on work the Planning Commission has been doing since 2020, as well as the Urban Growth Boundary Expansion Project, some of those land use efficiency measures that came out of that. The, um, <coughs> there is one notable um, item that I wanted to bring to your attention, and that is the residential zones, the changes that are proposed this evening that are in your packet. Here we have um, the slide that we presented on February 9th. And if you'll note that bottom bullet point that addresses the R2.5 or high density zoning district, there is a provision in there that prohibits new single family detached dwellings to be built in the R2.5 zone. This was a land use efficiency measure that came from the urban growth boundary project. And the language as you saw it in your packet for this evening 
still has this prohibition, as will the recommendation. But the Planning Commission would like to add a provision to allow properties that are currently within the city limits to propose a conditional use to build single family detached housing. So the Planning Commission realized that there really weren't very many properties that are zoned R2.5 that have development potential. And they felt that removing the potential to do single family detached really um, would be a potential detriment to those few properties. So they would like to update the code to add this provision into it. So Heather, could you yeah. just um, explain that in um, you know, code for dummies? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so currently the code says if you have an R2.5 property, you can build a single family detached home. And what we're trying to do with the UGB project is build more efficiently in our, in our residential land. So what we'd really like to see is our R7.5, our low density zone, have all single family detached houses. And then we'd like our R5 zone, our medium density, to be a mix of detached single families, uh, townhomes, maybe some duplexes, triplexes, that type of more middle housing style. And then really ideally your R2.5 zone is high density. So you really wanna see your multifamily projects, probably some townhomes, those type of projects and, and really limit those single family detached homes because there is so much opportunity elsewhere in the R7.5 and R5 zones to construct that type of home. So the way the code is being proposed with this provision in addition is that going forward, when we expand our urban growth boundary and bring in more land in these R2.5 zones, new properties that are zoned R2.5 won't be able to do that single family detached. They'll be looking at multifamily, townhomes, that sort of thing. And if you recall from um, our comp plan and from our housing needs analysis and from our UGB project, 30% of our anticipated residential development will be an attached single family and multifamily and 70% will be single family detached. That's our goal and our target. So we will have a lot of opportunities for single family detached. We just wanna preserve this R2.5 zone when we expand the UGB to really focus on those higher density housing types. So would that um, encourage um, more um, affordable housing options in the 2.5 zone? Yeah, I mean, the word affordable is pretty fraught in housing yeah. industry, but um, we could say- I hesitated it, using that right. word, actually. <laughs> Lower A, affordable, right? Um, but also, like, you could consider it more workforce housing or more approachable um, from a, a monthly budget standpoint. Yes, that would be the goal. Right, and I think as, as um, you know, the population ages, like, I would really like for us to consider, you know, having our- folks that are that they age in place and then they live in the place that they live you know like instead of being you know housed in a different um community um you know in a senior living plaza or whatever whatever but having that option i think if we have a ugb expansion um to be able to say you know let's let's have our folks age in place and provide them with housing that meets their needs in this particular zone would be really important, I think. Oh, and I, the, the demographics show that a lot, um, a lot of people are preferring these type of housing products, um, smaller lots, uh, attached housing, duplex, triplex, um, a lot of people who uh, have come out of school with a lot of debt, <laughs> people who don't wanna have um, maintenance um, are seeking different housing options. Um, and they're particularly, young families might be excited about the great schools that North Plains has to offer and proximity to jobs. And like Bill said, you know, when we're building up our economic base too, there might be places for more people to work. So let's provide housing for them to live in um, that they can do that. Yep. Was yeah. there someone else that wanted to comment? I'm sorry. I was just talking about aging in place. Uh, when I was in a panic mission, I had a big deal about that. And for me, what I thought aging in place was with people have mobility issues. These smaller houses where we have stairs, everybody lives upstairs and they back and forth. So these are more for younger people, not for aging in place. 
aging in place is more for the um, single level ranch style houses that they don't want to build anymore because they want to have 2,000 plus square feet and they want to have smaller lots for that. So these new ones are going to be anti-aging in place, I think. Well, I think the cottage clusters are also something that lends itself to more of a um, um, the, an older community as well. Yeah, but those are smaller houses, not the, uh, the marketing is going to be for 2,000 square feet-ish. They're going to be targeting that and that's going to be going upwards. But are those cottage clusters something that can be built in a 2.5 zone, Heather? That is true. Um, the cottage clusters would be permitted in the R2.5 zone and the maximum footprint of those would be 1,200 square feet. So those would oh. be a smaller housing type. Any Thank more you. questions about residential? Okay, great. Otherwise, the code uh, language as proposed stays exactly the same as what you saw in your packet in preparation for this evening. Um, so with that, with that proposed change, the North Plains Planning Commission does recommend that the City Council approve City File 22-001 as modified this evening, uh, approving the updated zoning code and comprehensive plan language. And then in your packet this evening, you had three sample motions. <coughs> and these remain largely the same with the addition of as modified at the city council hearing to that first one to just um, allow that conditional use permit for single family detached homes in existing R2.5 zones. Okay. That is all I have for a staff report, but I'd be happy to take questions. Any other council questions? Are there any public questions? Any questions from the public? Lori, can you provide input on that? I do not see anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, other than Councilor Papin has her hand raised. Okay, thank you. Councilor Papin? Thank you. Um, Heather, I was hoping you could help clarify um, some things. So just looking through some of these proposed changes, um, am I understanding on, on page 79 of our packet, under number three for side yard. I'm sorry, for rear yard. So number two, rear yard. Let me know when you're there. Okay, just a second. Page 79. Let's see. Okay, I'm there. So we're in the R2.5 zone. And then okay. for number two for rear yard, rear yard. Alley access lot two feet. So am I understanding correctly that someone's backyard, if they have an alley access lot, would only be two feet deep? Right, because if you have an alley access lot, your car is coming into its the garage right off the alley. And we want to discourage people from trying to park sideways. So the idea is if you give too much space, you might see people trying to do that. So uh, in the NC code currently, we have two to four <coughs> feet as the permitted width. Um, and we certainly could consider a range, but two feet would allow you space to put your garbage and recycling and maybe have some of that type of thing there, but it wouldn't allow a car to fit. Okay, I gotcha. That makes sense. I was thinking yeah. a little different. That's why I wanted right. to check. Sure. And then um, just one page up on page 78 of the packet. Okay. Um, for lot and parcel size number one. Um, and I just see it, it, it reduced down to 4,000 square feet. And, you know, and I'm thinking back to when we started talking about UGB expansion and, you know, what kind of, what kind of lot sizes, what kind of density do we want to have in North Plains? And remembering quickly, you know, there was a certain number of, of acres that we would have to use and it would be based on how many houses we wanted to, have annexed into, or, you know, property annexed into the city and it all, and this is where I'm hoping you can help clarify, because it almost feels like we're putting the, the horse before the cart in the sense of we're minimizing the lot size, but we haven't even had these UGB expansions and seeing, seeing a 4,000 square foot lot size, um, just feels like we're going to be forced to have really dense expansion, um, even before we've done the UGB part. So, can you help clarify maybe the reasoning why on that? 
Yes, the goal there is because it is your R2.5, your high density zoning district, we do want to see smaller lots um, if they're individual lots or larger lots that have multiple dwelling units on them. So um, the R7.5 stays up at the 7,500 and the R5 stays at the 5,000, but the R2.5, you really want to limit the amount of space each housing unit takes, if that makes sense. This is where you want to focus your density in your city. So that's why the smaller lot size. Okay, so, okay, that makes more sense, thank you. And then the last thing um, is on page 106 of the packet. Okay. And, let me see if I can find it on here. It's related to the garage size. Yeah, so um, just seeing attached or detached garages may count towards the minimum parking requirement provided the interior dimension of the garage, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at that and seeing that a three bedroom house, which most single family homes are, detached homes are, um, would, there wouldn't be a parking requirement, a additional on-street parking requirement, or is there something else built into the code somewhere? Um, Cause I'm just thinking again about some of the other developments in our city that have parking issues um, that likely met the code at the time, but this just seems, it doesn't seem like there's enough additional parking if we're going based on that garage size. Yes, and that um, it, it, garage spaces currently count as your off-street parking requirement. So we have been seeing developments come in with a garage that may be smaller than this inside um, and is counting as two parking spaces. Um, the Planning Commission originally was thinking 10 feet wide by 20 feet long because that's what a typical parking space is in like a parking lot, but then they did expand it to the 12 feet wide and 22 feet long per space. Um, so that it would allow for you to open your doors <laughs> once you're in that garage, you know, or, or have your workbench on the side and still park your car. So um, the requirement of 12 feet by 22 feet for each vehicle um, was the Planning Commission's attempt to take what's already, what's already permitted, which is counting your garage spaces as your off-street parking, and make it actually feasible to park your car in that space. So um, th that, that's already a code criteria that's in place that you can do that. They're just trying to make it more reasonable that you might actually do it. Okay, thank you so much. That's all I have. Yeah, you're welcome. Great questions, thanks. All right, any other questions for Heather from council? Can you post that amended? Um the uh, changed uh, sample motions on it. Sample, mo sample motions. Can you share that on the screen? Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Okay. All right. If there are no further questions from the city council um, and the public, then I will go ahead and close the public hearing at 8.03. All right. So now it's the council's turn to make a motion. What say you? I'll, I'll go ahead and move to approve city file number 22-001, Zoning and Development Code Comprehensive Plan text amendments as modified by the City Council hearing on February 22nd, 2022. And I will second. All right. We have a first by Councilor Sheldon, seconded by uh, Councilor Fage. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion carried. Um, before I ask for item number two, um, I uh, am working off of a computer. So is there possible, where would I find the actual ordinance by title so I can read it? What page? So I, I can share a different screen and pull that up if that'd be helpful. Uh, sure. Or just tell me what page. <laughs> I'm sure. page I'm sure. in the, uh, yeah, in the packet, it is page, oh, let me just, um, packet page 112. 112, thanks. Mm -hmm. You can put the sample motions back up. 
and I'll look at page 112. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have it. Thank you. Okay, um, the next motion that we will be looking for um, is to conduct the first reading of ordinance number 477 by title only. Do I have a motion? I'll make the motion. I move to conduct a first reading of ordinance 477 by title only. Okay, I have a first, do I have a second? Second. All right, we have a first by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Martinez. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion carries. So ordinance number 477 is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of North Plains, Oregon, implementing an update to the Zoning and Development Code and Comprehensive Plan. All right, third item on this particular agenda item then is to approve the first reading of ordinance number 477. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the first reading of ordinance 477. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. All right, Councillor Fage has a first, Councillor Smith with a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion uh, per, uh, motion carries um, to approve the first reading of ordinance number 477. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Good to Thank see you. you. Good to see yeah. you too. All right. Have a good night. You too. All right. Next up on our um, uh, agenda this evening is the city manager report. Andy. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, 67 minutes, and I don't think I've spoken yet. It's, uh, I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'll get to you later. Um, well, we covered a lot of ground, I think, with the reports earlier. Two things that I definitely wanted answers to tonight were um, what time we want the retreat to start, so I can work with the facilitator on that for, for March 7th. We kind of thrown around a couple of start dates, 3 p.m., 4 p.m., something like that. And also, if we're going to, if the council wants to go back to in-person meetings in uh, March or at a future date, so we can plan accordingly for that. Um, so I'll touch on a couple things. I just wanted to put those out there so we can circle back to them and I don't forget them. Um, one of the items uh, uh, that, that Bill, or that, that we'll definitely talk about um, at the retreat in March as we're talking about um, UGB. Uh, acreage needs is we have some of the draft results of the economic opportunities analysis. That'll be um, a topic of conversation um, on March 7th. Um, we did a, a page turn for the Jesse Mays plans last week, and um, we're getting all those final items wrapped up, um, incorporated into the plan set uh, to bid. Uh, we know that some things in there are going to need a large lead time. So we're all uh, cognizant of that, and if we reach a point in the summer um, where we start bumping up against uh, a major event there, that we want to have appropriate pause points uh, that would be necessary um, in the bid documents, and that way the, uh, the area is safe and the festival can still take place there. But we just know, like some things, like the infiltration system, those are those are 20, 25 weeks uh, lead time to uh, to order some of the. Uh, the vaults there. So we're planning around uh, some of those uh, supply chain issues. Um, we're also getting some quotes uh, for installing AC at Jesse Mays and we'll um, uh, select a contractor for that here probably uh, in March uh, to do that work. Um, Bill provided an update on the GOA. Um, we got a downtown plan meeting tomorrow. So we'll get um, another PAC meeting on that uh, going in March, and there will be uh, a, another community survey there. And I'm really looking forward to that because that's going to help determine what the next plan is for City Hall. Um, there's some design concepts that are, are in there for uh, downtown. 
um, for, for retail, for a civic center, for even some multifamily housing in appropriate spots. But once we get um, the PAC uh, input finalized in community survey and we kind of synthesize all that data in the report, um, that's when we can really uh, put a plan together for what we do with uh, City Hall. Um, so that's, that, that's sort of it. I think I included a lot of information uh, on Friday too that I probably would have uh, incorporated otherwise here. And we'll chat more later. But before we get too far ahead, what is the, um, what are folks' thoughts for a start date that would work for your, a start time, I'm sorry, that would work for your schedules on March 7th for the retreat? Any thoughts? It's over at the Puck and Ridge, right? Okay, so we're already in pizza there, or we're, we're am I still buying dinner, or, or do they cater, or do they <laughs> yeah, cater? Made, or what, I forgot, I forgot you there? made that. Uh, that was a very generous uh, uh, offer. They have menus there. They have like dinner menus there. Uh, they're pretty pretty reasonable. Tell you what, you and I can chat offline uh, about that if you if you really want to do that, or we'll find some other some other opportunity maybe i was going to buy as well pizza but that has a place that has food there so i don't know if they like pizza being uh, being like brought in i'll say pizza so I was, I was kind of worried about that yeah i think they would prefer you're going to use their space yeah. that you order from their order from the menu why don't you and i talk first, about that though we'll, we'll find a way I, to take you up on something i think our first retreat was pretty reasonable um uh priced at pumpkin ridge with food and and coffee and everything included too. So, um, so start time. I think we kind of threw out three or four o'clock. Um, I think uh, Councilor Papin um, put in the chat that you're available after three thirty. Okay. This is a four. Would a four o'clock start time work for folks? I yep yep. Three or four o'clock is. Okay, is fine. four o'clock. All right. Uh, Councilor Smith, you've got your hand raised. Do you have a question? Yeah, so if we're done with this part here. Oh, okay. Um, so four o'clock. And then um, Andy, just let us know about the food options. And if we need to make individual choices for ourselves, that would be great. And then I think your other question was the in-person meetings in March. Um, do we want to tackle that or Councillor Smith, did you have a question related to that? It's the something else. Oh, okay. I would say April so you can take a mask off. Any other thoughts? I would say April so you have a mask off. Yeah. I agree. I'm fine with resuming, personally, I'm fine with resuming in-person meetings starting in March, um, just knowing that as a state and as a county, we're all going towards that direction um, and knowing that the peak of Omicron is, is past, um, I'm, I'm comfortable with any time after March 1st. Okay. Any other feedback? Okay, well, um, then um, Andy, we can chat about that. We've got a couple of, we've got one for March and one for April. Um, I'm okay with March, I'm okay with April, um, but obviously I wanna make sure that uh, you all are comfortable with in-person meetings as well. Councilor Smith, what's your uh, question? It's to Andy. <laughs> The, on commercial, the car company there has got all those cars. Has there been a resolution to that one yet? No, no resolution. Uh, the basically the abatement uh, letter to them went out today, where it, it goes to the property owner and the business owner that you've been given warnings. Um, we have to see a resolution there. You can work with me on uh, cleaning up the property. Or we, we start enforcing at some pretty steep penalties per day. Um, so that, that uh, process is in motion. And um, 
I'm hoping to hear from them. You know, one of the things I talked to the mayor about last week was sometimes, I'm hoping not, but sometimes these situations can get prickly. They can get nasty if a, a property owner or business owner just wants to thumb their nose at our, um, at our rules and our processes. And then we, we start uh, following up on those. I'll be doing that, but once we start uh, racking up some legal bills to go through those proceedings, sometimes they can get costly. I've, I've, I've been through one of those uh, in a harbor getting rid of a junk boat. <laughs> um, so I just want everyone to be aware of that. I'm hoping it doesn't come to that. Um, I'll be doing probably most of the work um, to avoid having our attorney doing it, but just want us all to be aware. But I, I don't want that place looking like a blighted eyesore for our downtown. Ask the owner what he wants for it. How much do you want to sell the property for? I, I don't know. I, I the, the property, that's a good question. Yeah. It, that might be that might be part of the resolution. Yeah. It's I just think. a it's just a rental. And and they put up that business and I bet they had, you know, 10 cars there within a week. So I don't know if they just have a word of mouth business, they moved from somewhere else. I think if they went somewhere else, they'd probably do okay getting business. Um, but yeah, well, that I'm, might be part of the discussion is what do you want? I'm not the convinced on? there's an illegal activity going on there. Anyway, I want to bring another question up with that one. Uh, I think it was about two years ago, Russ had a good idea about code violations and maybe having some kind of small group that goes around and looks for these violations that we're having. I'm not sure exactly what his wording was on that, but I think there's a problem with the city. Uh, with all these new developments, they've got HOAs where most of the downtown North Plains doesn't. And so garbage collects and busted fences and all kind of other things. And is there something that we can put together to take care of that? Sounds like code enforcement to me, like a code Correct. enforcement officer. Or a, you know, a citizen's group or yeah, I talked about that for the stars, for the people that are old and retired. I want something to do. They could drive around and uh, do code enforcement. They wouldn't do the code enforcement. They would just write it up and submit it. And somebody, our code enforcement people could actually have a more targeted thing. So it was a volunteer um, aspect for it. And I've been pushing for that since uh, I moved to North Plains. And I think it's a good idea if we look into it a little bit deeper than this and put something together because that's gonna be a problem down in the future. That could be something maybe we could dive into a little bit um, at the retreat perhaps for a goal. I agree. Okay. All right. Um, any other comments or questions for Andy regarding his staff report? No, I can just say that I appreciate the Friday fives. Um, you know, that that to me is valuable. Um, and it, it fills all the blanks in between the reports we get otherwise or, or a monthly report like this. And I think it's right, you know, it's right on target for what I, what I like to see. So, you know, I don't feel like I'm, I'm out of communication and you know, I haven't had anything that I would would need to call or call them on or anything like that. But I, it's to me, it's valuable, so I appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the feedback. I also really appreciate it, Andy. And um, I guess my question for you is, how much of an impact does that have for you? Is it something that's realistic and we could keep seeing, or is it? Is it something not realistic? I guess um, I just I know you have a lot on your plate, but I do really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, no, it's it's like anything, as long as you build it into your schedule, you know, so I just make sure to build it into my schedule. OK, 
Thank you. And then I, well, I remind Andy, it's a 515 in business is basically something you should only take 15 minutes to write and a reader, reader can read in five minutes. Yeah, I, that's exactly right. I built up the, because I, I figured it should be more, more than just the council too. some of our department heads. So they are all aware too, because we, we get together in department head meetings, but that can go, we can go weeks between that and wonder what's happening at that property. But then everyone, everyone knows. And I, and I took your, you know, the, the, the chain of command there too. They report to me on a Thursday night or Friday morning, and I consolidate anything that's useful into my report to you. Um, so it's good to get data dumped before the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other comments or questions for Andy on his report? Um, any council reports? I know we still have a lot of night ahead of us. Um, I'm gonna just um, Throw a couple of things out there just to let you know. Um, Scoggins Dam, I've been in touch with um, Clean Water Services and they can do a Friday afternoon Scoggins Dam tour. Um, I'm gonna send an email out to all of you and um, maybe try to find a Friday afternoon um, where we might be able to get together and coordinate an exam, uh, a tour to go out to see Scoggins Dam and get um, up an update on that. Uh, second thing, I had a nice meeting with uh, Anthony Garbarino uh, yesterday, and we talked about recology and food waste collection in North Plains. So that topic might be coming back around to the council and having a deeper dive conversation on that and see if we can implement something like that. They're already doing battery collection in the recycling bin. So I don't know how many of you are doing that um, personally, but that's happening. And then um, as far as the other type of recycling um, in uh, through Garbarinos in North Plains that we talked about were, you know, like um, light bulbs and, you know, other types of household items that um, the company Ridwell um, is, um, collecting, but Garbarino said that they would love to um, come back to council and talk to us a little bit more about that and coordinate something to see how we might be able to, um, you know, encourage our community to do a little bit more recycling. They're also really eager and excited to help, um, to help out with the May cleanup day. Loved doing that last year at the St. Edwards. Looking forward to it again this year. So I um, had a really great visit with Anthony and um, I'm gonna, when I send my email out asking uh, for feedback on the Scoggins Dam tour, um, I'm gonna also give you a little bit more detail on the Garbarinos um, conversation just to get some input, okay? Um, and other than that, just, um, um, la, la. That's about it as far as I'm just my usual meetings, uh, mayor's meetings, uh, chair meeting, um, chair and mayor's meetings this past month, we talked about garbage and waste. Um, and so the timing with my meeting with Anthony was really, you know, was a good timing. Um, so we had a good conversation there. So um, that's all I have to report for this past month. Um, and again, just, oh, and I did attend the parks board meeting and um, we had a good meeting there, good conversation with the, with the group. Um, anyone else have meetings or items that they wanted to share from meetings that they attended? I could just share that I, I attended the last planning commission meeting, which was obviously trailing the work session that all of the council attended. And, and uh, there was a lot of thought and effort that went into this code that basically were working on uh we've you know adopted the first reading now and approved it and so we're working towards adopting that code and i uh basically just uh, thanked them for on behalf of the council for attacking the code and uh not only um because a, f a fair amount of those things are are necessary now, but they're going to be more important as we go forward, especially with the EGB expansion. And I think they're, you know, they're aware of that. They're cognizant of it. I think they're mindful of it. I think they were pretty deliberate in their approach to the code. 
I think they're fair in their approach to the code. And so, you know, I basically sent uh, our praises um, because I, I do think it's uh, work that uh, a lot of folks take for granted. It's, it's, it's a lot of um, boring uh, when you drill into some of those uh, provisions in the code that uh, are pretty dry, but they're pretty necessary. And we need folks who are, you know, thinking thoroughly about, you know, what those impacts are. So I, I think we've got a pretty good ground set we, we're, we're, we're gonna be adopting here in, in another couple of meetings. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Sheldon. Uh, Councillor Kendall, you were raising your hand. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Okay, thank you. Don't go on that thing. <laughs> anyway, is Trista still with us? Yes, oh. she is. Trista, uh, this comment's uh, for you and the council. <clears throat> anyway, Trista asked me on February 10th in the afternoon if I could attend the uh, virtual CDBG meeting. And I almost didn't, but I thought, nah, I'm gonna do it. She asked me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it for her. So I get on there and it gets going and about just about the last 10 minutes of the meeting, uh, Jenny Proctor says, well, but she said, it sure is good to see you. I says, uh, this is kind of coincidental that you're here tonight. And uh, why would that be? And I told her. So anyway, she had the news that she's going to retire in August. And I was one of the ones that helped hire her <laughs> for the position that probably seven, eight years ago after Peggy Linden retired. So she was, uh, it was pretty neat. You know, I, I believe that was divine providence that night and she was happy and I was happy. So thank you, Trista, for what you did. <laughs> Thanks for the phone call. <laughs> thank, thank you, Butch, and yeah. perfect timing. And yeah, uh, yeah, I, I owe you. So thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good deal. All right. Um, any other comments or questions? We've got the calendar. Everyone's good there. Okay. All right. So now we are. I'm going to item number nine, which is executive session. And I know that um, uh, Andy's gonna provide me with a host ability. So you're gonna have to just bear with me on that. And I believe Lori has to uh, read um, a script for the executive session. So Lori, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Mayor Linehan. <clears throat> the city council will now meet in executive session under ORS 192.660 parentheses two parentheses I to review and evaluate the employment related performance of the chief executive offered officer who does not request an open hearing. Only news media representatives and staff designated by city council are permitted to attend the executive session. News media representatives, staff and council members are respectfully directed not to report on any of the discussions that occur during the session except to state the general subject as previously announced. The council will return to a regular session if there is a need for action on the executive session item. No final action or decision may be taken in executive session. Any materials distributed will be collected by city recorder at the end of the meeting. If there is a need to reconvene in regular session, um, then the mayor calls it back into, into order at that time. So, so Lori, I do have a question for you because we are virtual and I, it was one thing I guess I didn't think about, but when I listened to you read that, you are going to collect things from us at the end of the meeting and that would be if we were in person. Right. So um, I do know that um, many of us have documents probably in front of us to reference for the executive session. Is there a best practice on what we should do with the documents that we have? Should we just shred them ourselves or should we bring them to you in an envelope at City Hall? Do you have any suggestions? Um, it, it is up to the decision of you, Mayor, what, what to do. I am comfortable with having people bring them in an envelope and I can destroy them. Or if you're comfortable with um, each counselor destroying their own, you can um, determine that that's how you would want it to be done. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So I'm, I'm going to step out now unless you need me for anything else. Um, no, thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate it.
And then Andy, um, so when, um, when we are ready to have you come back in, I'll just uh, send you a quick text and then um, hopefully I don't lose everybody on this. <laughs> It's yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty simple. I'll, I'll give host to you, but it really doesn't. It really doesn't mean much. It just means that the meeting will end uh, pretty much. Right, so, and we're not be, and we're not being recorded. Right, I'm going to pause the recording right now. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. So um, here we are, the uh, city council regular session meeting, Tuesday, February twenty second. 2022, we have come out of executive session at 9.58. Um, so now that we're in open session, um, we need to circle back around and um, make a, a, I'd like to have a counselor perhaps make a recommendation on the uh, employee performance evaluation regarding um, Andy's contract for the term and any type of um, merit increase um, and I can take all of that in one motion if someone would like to do that. Well, I, I can do that. Uh, yeah, Matt, I, I move that uh, we extend the contract with the current city manager, Andy Barner, uh, for the period of three years uh, effective from the date of its uh, uh, end. So that date, uh, I believe, is June 30th, 2022. And that with that extension, we provide a merit uh, of 7% and a COLA of 2.5. All other terms of the contract would stay in force and effect. I will second. Okay. We have a motion on the table by Councillor Sheldon, seconded by Councillor Page. Any discussion? Yeah. Councillor Kendall, and then, yeah. Yeah, um, I thought the contract started July 1, not June 30th, or not June 1st, but July 1st. It does, I, I think, think, yep, July 1st, 2022. Oh, I thought I heard Russ say June, but maybe I didn't hear it right. <laughs> Extended from the date of June thirtieth, it ends oh, at okay. midnight right. on thirtieth. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Um, Andy, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I would just say um, when it comes to cola, I think it's worded just whatever the level other city employees receive it. So it could be two point five. Could even be less. Could be two. But just consistent with what other kind of city employees may receive. So there's no and that's fine. Um, yeah. And I know that um, um, the budget, and I referenced the budget when I looked at that, um, was uh, 2.5 in the budget. So um, that's where I that's where I pulled that information. Well, then they'll, they'll, the budget. well they'll take care of something. All right, any other discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion carries. All right, well, um, congratulations, Andy. And thank you everybody for your input. Really appreciated. I know this process wasn't the easiest, but um, thank you so much for um, everyone's thoughtful comments and input, really appreciate that. So um, anything else? We're all ready to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the city council meeting then at 10.02, sleep well, everybody. See you guys. Bye. Thank you all, appreciate it.